So three band leaders in one night. Yeah. Did I tell this no. on record? No. <laughs> well, this is the honest to goodness truth, and it's very timely right now. Um, I was with Downbeat, and one of my duties was, it was a nice duty, was to present the Downbeat plaques uh, to the winners in the Reader's Poll, Critic's Poll, whatever, and I did that a number of times with many different people. So this time, Ellington was booked at uh, Basin Street East, at Basin Street East, and uh, it was over the holidays, uh, and uh, I had two plaques for him because he'd won uh, Best Big Man and also Arranger Composer. So <clears throat> this was actually on the air on CBS something. And I was a little nervous, but I uh, managed to do it. And uh, it's actually captured on uh, some kind of air check. And it was the air check is a little off speed, so my voice sounds a little too high pitched. <laughs> but anyway, I presented it with a little speech, about it, and Ellington said, Thank you very much, Mr. Morgenstern, pronouncing my name properly, which wasn't always the case. It's not that it's such a difficult name, but people often manage to mispronounce it. The only other one in public who got it absolutely right was Bernadette Peters on a Grammy show when I got a, was mentioned in the role of people who had won technical awards. Anyway, uh, so I presented these plaques to Duke and uh, stayed for a while uh, uh, to listen to the band. Uh, but then I left because I was due to attend, uh, this is a, a, a New Year's Eve, so I was, uh, I, I was invited, my father was uh, very good friends with Al Hirschfeld, the famous, Al didn't want to call himself a cartoonist, you know what you want to call him, he was pretty unique. They called him the Lion King because of his lion ability. It's, but his ability was to capture faces without making, not caricatures, but he captured the essence of an individual. In any case, uh, he and my father were very good friends, and I was invited to a party at Al's house, which I could only get to because it was snowing that night and there was quite an accumulation. So the only way to get there from where I was, and uh, Al at the time had a, a house on building on uh, uh, between Park and Lexington on 85th Street. So I went to the bus stop at Third Avenue, and I'm waiting for the bus uh, when I hear a voice behind me, and it says, "Pardon me." Does this bus stop at 66th Street? And I turned around and answered. I said, yes, Mr. Goodman, it does. There was Benny, there were no cabs to be had. It was a snow summer. No cabs, nothing. It was stuck with the bus, whatever. You had. Benny lived on, uh, on 66th, but, uh, right off 3rd Avenue, or right off 2nd Avenue. But anyway, uh, so I said, yes, Mr. Goodman, and he didn't seem surprised. <laughs> I knew we had met briefly a few times, but he didn't recognize me, and I didn't, you know, I, I, I was not going to tell him, oh, you tell who I am or anything, because I was interested in observing, I wanted to see how many people might recognize him. He was beautifully dressed, by the way. He had a Chesterfield, an overcoat, and a wearing a hat. And of course, I recognized the voice right away behind me there. But I wanted to see how many people on the bus. The bus was pretty crowded. So I looked and nobody, nobody glommed him. And he was there right for everyone to see. I mean, Benny was a pretty sizable guy. You know, he was, uh, so he went off the bus. I wished him Happy New Year. And he went off the bus. And uh, I continued up to... Uh, 
up to near Al Hirschfeld's place. I got off the bus and walked up the street and Al had a beautiful big apartment and uh, liked to have parties and uh, we got a lot of people there. But as I came in and got my coat off and I was about the snow off before I went in the house uh, and there one of the first people I saw was friendly with Al was Artie Shaw. <laughs> so I couldn't resist for some reason or other I, it got into my my, my head <laughs> I, uh, I knew Artie uh, because we had been together on a board of the New York Jazz Museum, not the one now, but the, uh, its predecessor, the one that uh, Jack Bradley and Howard Fisher ran. Uh, Artie was on the board and uh, he was a terror on the board, let me tell you, because he never stopped talking. Uh, <clears throat> he was always interesting when he talked, but he could talk for a while. So I said, <laughs> I met him, he said, I said to him, I said, I, could, I said, I just got off the bus with Bernie Goodman. <laughs> and I knew, of course, Artie and Benny were not exactly... I mean, Benny had no problem with Artie, but Artie had a problem with Benny because he always wanted to be first, you know. I, he was... he really tore into Leonard Feather when Leonard did one of his, you know, best of all time things. and. The, Los Angeles time. This was long after, Benny was already gone for quite a long time, but Artie was still alive. And uh, uh, Leonard picked Benny as the, you know, I, Leonard told me that Artie called him up and really, you know, laid it out. Uh, how could you? And all that. So when I, when I said that to Artie, he looked at me as if I was insane. And finally, but then I, I explained it to him, of course. And, and so I, but this was Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, and Artie Shaw, all within the course of less than two hours, I would say. Uh, New York is a wonderful place. <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, Benny was a very hard interview, by the way. But I got one good line out of him. That was when, you know, he would go periodically to Thailand where he was invited to, by the king to, the king was an aspiring a saxophonist <laughs> and uh, you know Benny would be invited to the palace and play with it. So anyway I had a hard time. This was at, at, at his apartment, his hot beautiful apartment. Down. I think there was a, there was probably, I think it was a Cezanne that was on the wall. Uh, one of the things that was on the wall. Anyway it didn't go very, I mean, he was nice enough, but it was just hard to get more than a couple of words out of him. So anyway, I finally asked him about Siam and the king with the visit and so on. And uh, I said about the king, how does he play? And Benny thought for a moment and he said, mm, pretty good for a king. <laughs> So that was that was a good line that I got out of him. Uh, so I mean about Ellington, my God, uh, it's some different situations. Like one was a dance in Chicago, was an urban league dance, where there would be a, the people there were of a certain age, you know, and they would make requests, and one of the requests was for Harlem Airshaft, which of course is not an easy thing to play. It had been out of the band book for ages. This was in the, in the 70s. Uh, yeah, when I, the late 60s, could have been around 1968 or something. So anyway, nevertheless, Ellington was one to never decline uh, a request when he was playing something like a dance, you know. And, uh, so, <laughs> man, they, they tried to play it. The few people know, Lawrence knew it, Harry knew it, J Johnny knew it, and uh, I forget who the bass player was then, 
uh, and of course Duke, <laughs> so, but hardly anybody else. Maybe Russell Proko. Uh, it, it was before Jimmy Hamilton's time, but Jimmy was very adept. Uh, in any case, they managed to kind of work their way through it, but it, it was very interesting because it became a sort of avant-garde version. <laughs> But that was the thing with Duke, he always liked to answer requests. He could easily have said, we don't, you know, we don't play that anymore, which was the case I hadn't played it in, in 20 years. Uh, well, it was remarkable what a large repertory the band had at any given time. You know. And it was also remarkable to be in a recording situation with them where they would encounter something for the first time. And I talked about that All-American, which clearly was the case there. But uh, you no know, other instances. There was a, a beautiful album of non-Ellington material called the DeBal Mask. And uh, I was at part of that session, it came in pretty late, but they played it back in that studio, and boy, the way it sounded there, because that's so beautifully recorded. And uh, Johnny Hodges' daughter, f favorite Johnny Hodges recording was from that, it was Alice Blue Gown from that session, which really is so pretty. Another interesting Ellington encounter was uh, when I, I was in New Orleans uh, for uh, one of the early of those festivals that was really started by George Wayne, uh, whatever it was called, it had a long name, well, something yeah. about jazz, yeah. heritage. Yeah, New Orleans Jazz and Heritage. heritage yeah. Which had very little jazz and quite a lot of heritage. <laughs> anyway. At the time, Al Hurt had its club on uh, Bourbon Street. It was a very nice club. And Al, by the way, whatever you may think of his trumpet playing, was a very nice man. And he had the Ellington Band in there, and uh, had, they had carte blanche do what they wanted. And at the time, Ellington was about to record, he already was contracted by Atlantic to do the New Orleans Suite, and he had just written it. And he debuted some of it there, but they were still working on most of it. So this was actually like an open rehearsal uh, at the club, which was perfectly okay with Al. You know, they really played stop and go, you know, and we've gone through things. And that was really interesting. But this was very shortly after Johnny's death and one of the pieces in the suite was a dedication to Sidney Bechet which was meant for Johnny and Ellington had hoped to seduce Johnny to play the soprano on it which he hadn't played in years and he was such a wonderful soprano player I mean that's just beautiful I always regretted that he didn't, that he put that horn away. But of course that didn't happen. And uh, Paul was enlisted to do it instead on tenor, which was, uh, worked out all right, but not what it could have been. But anyway, it was really interesting to be at the, what was an open rehearsal in the club, you know, and uh, it was a an odd thing, I don't think any other band was ever booked in a club and got away with doing that because it was a stop and go thing. It was, uh, and obviously the people who were there were rather sophisticated ladies. <laughs> but they didn't get, but Paul did one thing. I mean, they took breaks in between. Paul liked to stroll. Strolling is walking around uh, tables and playing directly to them. And he did that and he played, I wish, Somebody would have recorded that. He played Ramona. Ramona. Ba -da 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 Oh, did he play it beautifully? And uh, one of the tables he played to was one that I was sitting at. <laughs> he, he really liked to do that, the strolling. And uh, uh, Hotlips Page liked to do that too. 